Hello and welcome to this edition of Hacknaked TV. I'm your host, Bo Bullock, and this week we're going to talk about vulnerable SSH keys up on GitHub. We're talking about SourceForge, uh, hijacking user accounts that distribute adware. Uh, we're going to talk about a $12 device that will allow you to open a large amount of garage doors, and I'm going to demo a, uh, a new function built into Meterpreter that I feel is pretty damn awesome. As always, Hack Naked TV is brought to you by Black Hills Information Security. If you're in the need of a penetration test, vulnerability assessment, or any other type of security assessment for that matter, contact Black Hills Infosec by sending an email over to consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com. All right, so GitHub, vulnerable SSH keys. Security researcher Ben Cox uh, came out with a report that, uh, or he, he, did, he did an analysis of the SSH keys up on GitHub. Uh, so as, as a user of GitHub, your, your public key is available um, to pretty much everyone on the planet. So he went and downloaded all the keys and did an analysis uh, of, of each of the keys for the levels of encryption that were used to generate these keys. He found that two of them only had 256 bits of encryption. Five of them only had 512. Um, and he basically did a quick proof of concept just to show how easy those are to reverse to uh, the actual private key form um, by generating a 256-bit SSH key and reversing it in less than 25 minutes with a very, very minimalistic computer. Um, he also discovered that a very large amount of the keys that were up there were also vulnerable to a uh, very old OpenSSL bug from 2008 that also would allow for a, a very easy reversal to the actual private key. Um, some of these keys were used to commit to very large projects uh, like things like um, like Spotify, Python's core, the crypto libraries for Python, and the Russian search engine Yand Yandex. So Ben recommends that uh, all of us who use GitHub need to go uh, through all of our commits over the last few years and make sure that uh, no uh, very strange um, activity was done um, maliciously uh, because... Potentially, you know, he wasn't the first one to find this. I mean, he, he found it and reported to GitHub, but the idea is that, um, you know, anyone could have found this just as easily as Ben did and done very malicious things with it. So go check your, your repos and, and uh, make sure that all, all your, the commits are valid commits and make sure that someone didn't mess with your software and, you know, install backdoor or something with your key. This is an interesting story. Um, so SourceForge, um, if you're not familiar with the website, it's a uh, it's a site where m multiple vendors can host their software for download for uh, uh, you know easy easy access for users to go download their software. Um, GIMP came came forward last week stating stating that SourceForge itself hijacked the uh, the actual project or the account um, from GIMP and repackaged it with revenue enhancing features, which basically just means the hardware, and started redistributing it through their website. Um, now this week, Nmap also came forward with the same statement um, that uh, SourceForge hijacked their account. Uh, they, they said there hasn't been any you know, adware added in yet, but who knows, like that, then today or tomorrow. Uh, VLC came forward with all this news that the same thing happened to them back in 2012. Uh, same thing, you know, hijacked, adware added in. So the bottom line is from each of these vendors, I mean, it, it, they basically state the same thing. You know, download from the source and not from SourceForge anymore because, you know, it's it's one thing to just, you know, allow us to host our software on a site, um, but there's no there's no reason to go and take it and start repackaging it with AdWords just to make, you know, revenue for yourself. That's not cool. Um, so, you know, go download Nmap from Nmap.org. Don't download from SourceForge anymore. Open Sesame. So this is an awesome new vulnerability that was discovered in garage doors. Um, a security researcher found that fixed pin garage doors and gates uh, could easily have their pins brute forced um, in less than three minutes with a device um, that is running the code of the security researcher. Uh, that device is the one pictured in the, uh, the image below uh, that costs about $12 and is a child's toy. Um, that was previously used for just sending like text messages and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> so he, he was able to convert that to a device that runs his code that will open garage doors, which is pretty awesome. Um, it doesn't work on, on doors that have rolling code technology. Uh, some, some of the current vendors that are still vulnerable to this are Nortec, North Shore Commercial Door, um, and uh, there, there actually were some previously vulnerable vendors. So what that means by previously vulnerable means they, they've updated their garage door software now, but if you haven't gone and updated your software, you're still probably vulnerable to this. Uh, some of these vendors are Chamberlain, LiftMaster, Stanley, Delta 3, Morvomatic. Um, but yeah, if, if, you, uh, if you go update your software on your garage door, you're probably going to be good because it's probably going to update its rolling code technology. But if you want to build one of these, you can. Um, go go uh, you know on eBay, buy one of these uh, these kids' toys, and uh, follow the instructions in the uh, the link below. Um, the only caveat is that the uh, security researcher did 
neuter the, the code itself. So unless you're an expert in RF, you might not be able to get it to work. If you do get it to work, please send me an email because I'd love to see that code. <clears throat> so uh, Meterpreter Transport Control. So Metis the Metasploit project came out with an awesome update to Meterpreter that basically allows you to move between different transport control methods now within a Meterpreter session. What a transport is, is essentially like something like reverse TCP, reverse HTTPS. So a lot of times you might get a shell with like, let's say, reverse, H or reverse TCP Meterpreter. And then on the fly you're like, well man, I, I really wish I had, you know, done a you know reverse HTTPS like just to kind of avoid avoid detection uh, a little bit better um, but in, instead of now having to actually drop like an entire new payload to establish that reverse HTTPS connection um, you can literally just change the transport method within the interpreter shell itself which I think is pretty damn awesome um, and the other thing that's really cool about this is that each each new transport method you add um, if one of those dies it's going to automatically switch to the next one so let's demo this to kind of show why I like this so much. Um, all right, so on my command and control server, I've got three different listeners set up, three different uh, handlers. Um, I've got a reverse TCP listener on 8080. I've got a reverse HTTPS listener on 443, and I've got a reverse HTTP listener on 80. So three different listeners on three different boards. Um, over here on my Windows box, we're going to pretend that I fished a user and uh, got them to run an executable. You know, who, who would ever run an executable, right? So we're going to run our, our it's just, this is just a standard reverse TCP meterpreter payload over port 8080. This should connect back to my command and control box. Give me a session. It does. Awesome. So now, let's interact with a session. Or let's actually, let's just list it out first. So we've got session 16 here. I mean, you can see it's a normal meterpreter session. So the, the new command that has been added in is called transport. So if you just type transport, it'll give you the, the help menu. Um, if you do transport list, it will list out the various transports that are available to you currently. So while I have three different listeners up right now, the interpreter session doesn't know about those right this moment. So what we can do though is add in, we can do tr uh, transport add dash L, we'll add in our local host or our command and control server IP, whatever it is for you. Um, I'm gonna do go ahead and do the, um, the reverse HTTPS transport on port 443. So this that command essentially, transport add dash L for IP, the local host IP, dash P for local port, dash T for the type of um, uh, transport you want, and enter. And now if we do transport lists, we'll see that we have, we have two different types of transports that we have available to us. So now if this transport dies, if for some reason a firewall kills our connection on TCP port 8080, it's gonna automatically switch over to reverse HTTPS on 443. I think that's pretty damn awesome. Um, you can also manually switch um, between them by doing the uh, either like transport change or transport next or previous command. But you can come in here and add in as, as much of these transports as you want. So like you could have 100 different payloads listening on different servers on you know around the world or 100 different handlers I should say and 100 different transports in in your single interpreter session. So um, you know as the IR team starts to kill off your sessions, uh, you know it's going to start jumping around on the IR team, which is going to make it hard for them to find you. So let's go back over here to um, our Windows box real quick, just to kind of demonstrate what it would look like to kill the TCP connection. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add a firewall rule real quick with NetSH to block TCP port 8080 from leaving my Windows box. So this, in theory, should kill my interpreter session. If we come back over here, Interpreter session is still there, but it just hasn't it hasn't reported that it's dead yet. But it, it is dead. So if I try to do sys sysinfo now, you can see the interpreter session died right here. But before you even see that that it's dead, it automatically opened up a new session on 443 over HTTPS. So check it out. So if we if we look at um, our sessions now, you can see that the session is actually operating over port 443. So let's get back into the session and do transport list. You can see that we're, we're operating under the reverse HTTPS transport at this point, which is pretty freaking awesome. I mean, there, there's times where, you know, I'm, I'm on a test and, you know, a, a firewall will, will kill a, a, a session because it's like, oh, interpreter, let's, let's kill that. Um, but in the event it does, and you have backup transports available, um, you know, that can, that can help go a long way. So anyways, I thought it was a cool thing to kind of show you guys. 
Well, that is it for this edition of Hack Naked TV. If you want to watch more Hack Naked TV, check out hacknaked.tv. Um, check out the always uh, always hilarious, always informative Security Weekly at blip.tv slash Security Weekly. Uh, you can also check out the show notes for Security Weekly at securityweekly.com slash wiki. wiki. Um, and uh, I will be speaking at the HCCIA conference in, in August, um, or well, August 30th through September 2nd. Um, on command control testing and data exfiltration techniques. You can use the uh, the promo code below, it's uh, HackNaked, all uppercase, no spaces, to get 15% off uh, your admission fee to that conference. Um, if you want to contact me, my email is bo at blackhillsinfosec.com. If you wish to hit me up on Twitter, I am at DaftHack. Have a great weekend. Talk to you later.